Welcome to the Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. I am one of your co-hosts, Derek Anderson, and I am thrilled and chilled to be joined today by fellow co-hosts Tamika Jones and Scott Drevitt. Thank you very much for joining me today. We've got a really hey, good conversation hey. lined up. <laughs> we do. Hey. Hey. Hey, you know you, hey. Guess what? Evil ends tonight, maybe? Evil ends tonight. Evil, Evil ends, ends tonight. tonight. Yes, get those chants ready because we are talking about Halloween ends on this episode of Corpse Club. It has been several years since the chants of evil dies tonight have faded in the autumn wind and the leaves have blown down the street and Michael Myers presumably disappeared into the night. But he might still be out there because... In this episode of Corpse Club, we are going to be talking all things about the return of Michael Myers in Halloween Ends, along with a lot of other goodies, Laurie Strode, Allison, a very pivotal new character. So we are going to start off with some general thoughts before we get into spoiler territory. So you're still safe for now if you haven't seen it yet, but we'll give a little warning when we go past the point of no return. But in the meantime... Uh, let's start with you, Tamika. What were your just kind of initial thoughts after seeing Halloween Ends for the first time and just kind of processing what you just saw on screen? Okay. So I did not watch this in theaters. I watched it on Peacock. Peacock. <laughs> I don't know if anyone <laughs> remembers those commercials. Peacock. But um and it was still a great experience because I was wor worried about that, you know, um, if that would maybe kind of, you know, change how I felt about the film. Mm -hmm. But no, I definitely think this is still something that you can watch at home and still be spooky, you know, it's the time of year, although spooky is all year round. Um, but honestly, after having watched it, I feel very conflicted and we're going to get into why <laughs> much later, I promise. But I, so I, I, there's a lot I like about it and there's a lot I really don't. And some things I feel like kind of in the middle about and maybe two or three tweaks to the story, I think I would be less conflicted. That is, is that... the key word conflicted on this. Okay. It, it feels like just looking online, seeing the reactions, it feels like a lot of people, it's very polarizing. It's one of those movies where a lot of people either love it and a lot of people hate it. And there's not a ton of people that are in the middle, but it's very interesting to see all the reactions so far. And it sounds like you also have some some very conflicting thoughts on it, which I'm looking forward to diving into in a little bit. Oh, yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I promise. I promise, Derek. We're going to get into it. <laughs> it's going to be a very we're going to really dissect some things on this episode. But uh, before we do, Scott, what about you? Did you uh, see this in theaters? Did you watch it on Peacock? And uh, what were your initial thoughts? I do not have the cock, so we oh saw it gosh. in the theater. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I got to tell you, I'm in the and you and you're right. It's very much a it's very much a porridge movie, right? It's a Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's pe people either hate it, it's too cold, or they love it, it's too hot, and like Goldilocks is nowhere to be found. Uh, that, uh, so I'm very curious as well to hear, uh, Tamika's take. I really dug it, uh, with reservations. Of course, I think it's, um, I think it's as messy as the other two movies in the trilogy. Uh, but I also think it's by far the weirdest of the trilogy, which if you can't do the ramped up adrenaline action of kills then you know weird is actually the better way to go and um 
I I really like the way it ends up, and I think it sticks the landing. And and I think the premise behind it is really intriguing. Is there some missteps along the way? Yeah, same like uh, if you're familiar with the other movies, they're very consistent. Um, but I really like the way everything wrapped up, and uh, so yeah, I'm very much team hot porridge uh, for Halloween ends. That that is, I love. Well, first of all, I want that slogan on a T-shirt because I who doesn't like porridge? Who doesn't like Halloween? That's just fun for the whole family, right there. Right. Um, and it's it's interesting you mentioned that because yeah, this is the. I think a lot of Halloween movies, other I think other than that first one that John Carpenter and Deborah Hill did, there's a lot of like porridge movies when it comes to the Halloween franchise where people don't necessarily agree on the rankings um, after that original film. And it's been really fascinating to see where Halloween ends falls in the entire filmography when they do the rankings on Twitter. Oh, everyone's rankings right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I, interesting. I put, I put mine up and I had uh, like many people, I had Carpenter's Halloween first, but then I looked in and what I had for my two, three, and four spot was uh, uh, Rob Zombie's uh, H2. Uh, Halloween two is, was number two. My number three, I think was uh, season of the witch. And then my number four was ends. And I looked at that and I went, well, you know what? Those are barring the first original uh, film. Those next three movies are the weirdest movies in the Halloween franchise. I, maybe that's just, I guess I was drawn, I've been drawn to that in, in the franchise. If you're the ones that I guess step away from the strict, you know, uh, pro forma, uh, stock and slash, right? Something that's a that are that's a little different that are reaching for for something more or just trying something different, right? And I think those those are the movies that uh, that that reflect that. Yeah, your your top four is very interesting because it is something very different for each installment, and it's not not a four movie stretch that uh, a lot of people might agree on but i love it because it's something <laughs> different and like i i personally enjoy all, like all four of those so but so there's like a lot of whiplash get... there right um <laughs> i don't think there's you know i don't i mean it's subjective there is no wrong ranking although i've seen somewhere i the horror snob in me has wrinkled my nose a couple times when i've seen some movies <laughs> ranked higher than i think should be humanly possible but that's the beauty of it right we can each mm. have our own opinion on on these franchises um so this is what of of halloween this is the uh timeline wise is this is what the third timeline i believe i think well so, you've right? got the, yeah well, the original well you've got the the h2o timeline the four or five timeline you've got the uh, the new trilogy timeline. So yeah, I think you could say three. I could, I think you could say three, maybe four, if you want to make an argument on. Oh, and then of course the Rob Zombie timeline as well. So there's definitely you know a few to pick from at this point, which is kind of fun, right? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Myers multiverses. Yes. <laughs> this is, Years I guess, for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? True. And, and I guess, <laughs> and I guess the reason that I was bringing that up is, and it's something you alluded to too, the, the way um, the reactions are either super hot or or super cold, with some maze, you know, some some lukewarms in the middle. But um, why is everyone so precious about it when there's so it's so fragmented? And do you know what I mean? Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's the, people are treating it like it's this precious like stone or something. And how could you do that to Michael? I'm not saying what, because we're still in no spoiler zone. But do you know what I'm saying? Like people. <laughs> right. And I'm thinking to myself. My God, I'm not picking on Cult of Thorn here, but, you know, we've had Cult of Thorn and 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 the fucking dude with the cowboy boots and, and the jacket and the cowboy hat. Right. Like 
come on, folks, we can <laughs> we can survive this. OK, you'll make it through. It's OK. I don't like to be the one who says it's just a movie because I get this way about stuff as much as people do. But like I, I've seen people that seem to be getting like really angry at uh, some of the turns and twists in this movie. And. Folks, you know, in the words of Sergeant Holka from uh, Stripes, lighten up, Francis. <laughs> I think it's it's always a good Halloween episode. We can incorporate Stripes into it as well. I think that Why makes not? a good double feature. It's it's universally just it just works. And I, I think you're right. I think, I, you know, going into this movie, I think there's a little extra pressure because it's kind of billed as like the final chapter in the Laurie Strode saga with Michael Myers. So I think people kind of come in almost with expectations that maybe can't even be met because it's, they want it to be like so perfect in their own way. And, you know, I was no different. I went into this um, sod in theaters with uh, had my parents, my sister, my brother-in-law, uh, Zach and Sarah, who are the awesome hosts of Soup Fest, which we will get into in uh, another episode uh, coming up. So stay tuned for that. Lots uh -oh. of uh, <laughs> yeah, lots of Soup Fest shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, you can't do Soup Talk without Jonathan. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Soup Fest can't happen without Jonathan. He'd be he would lose his. He'd lose his mind. We'll save that for our uh, Halloween hangover episode when we dive into all sorts of of the seasonal goodness. But, uh, you know, it was just fun seeing it, though, in a packed theater. And it kind of felt it did feel like kind of the end of an era with, you know, this this last chapter of, of Laurie Strode's story, or, or at least, um, you know, what people have been what, what it was advertised as. And uh, but just initial thoughts from myself is I just I had a lot of fun with it, like. I guess after Halloween kills, I really just like all of my all the everything I thought I knew about this new like trilogy or quadrilogy, if you want to include the original one, like it just went out the window because I thought everything that I thought they would do after the 2018 Halloween, they like went in a different direction and kills. So coming into this one, I just was like, all right, let's just have Michael let his hair down and we'll see what happens. And I was never like. I was never bored. I was never, I never really knew what was going to happen because it does take some like really hard left turns in the movie and does some really unexpected things. Uh, so it was definitely not the ending I expected uh, for, for this chapter of the franchise, but I, I had a good time with it uh, overall, but I can definitely empathize with how polarizing it is, you know, for a lot of viewers too, because it does go in such a different direction. So, well, and you, and you're right. It's, you know, hyped as the, the final film. So we all go in with our own preconceptions about how it's going to end. Did this end the way, and when I say, end, I mean the final movie, not like the final moments of, of the movie, but did it end the way I thought it was going to, not exactly, and we'll get into uh, the why of that uh, in a bit. But even still, without doing that, um, what they decided to do, I thought was very interesting. Uh, maybe it's not completely pulled off for reasons, again, we can talk about later, but uh, I thought the concept was so good and i thought that most of it worked so well and yes it wasn't the uh halloween ends that i wanted but maybe it was the one i needed Ooh. deep that's deep man i love it well i yeah. think that's a i think this is a good time you know we've talked about initial thoughts it's going to be difficult to continue talking without really getting into it, really dissecting it a little more. So I think this is going to be the, the warning. If you have not seen Halloween ends, I think we're going to start getting into some spoilers. We're going to start revealing 
some uh, plot details here that you may or may not want to hear if you haven't seen the movie. So this is the point of no return. And, you know, cue the sirens, whatever noise will uh, instigate that reaction. There you go. You get Tamika going, woo, 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 woo. I love it. The ha- all right, it. the Halloween sirens have been rung. That's right. Uh, let's let's now step into Haddonfield even further. Uh, I guess we'll just start this by kind of just going a little more into the plot here. Um, one of the biggest things about Halloween Ends that really was a curveball that I don't think a lot of people saw coming is that it really focuses on this new character named Corey Cunningham, who is played by Rowan Campbell. And... What happens with this character is he is a babysitter um, in 2019 on Halloween night, kind of after Michael Myers' um, most recent rampage in Haddonfield. And he ends up involved in this tragic accident where uh, through kicking a door open during a game of hide and seek, he ends up inadvertently killing the boy that he was watching Um, while babysitting and he falls uh, to his death and he you know years later a couple years later he gets out of you know he he is back in society after being arrested and and presumably serving some time for this and we see him try to kind of reassimilate into Haddonfield and now a few years have passed by since the 2018 Halloween movie and Halloween Kills and we see kind of Lori Strode living with her granddaughter, Allison, after Lori's daughter and Allison's mom was killed at the end of Halloween Kills. So we see them kind of rebuilding their lives. Lori actually seems to be doing relatively well as far as moving on while Allison is, you know, obviously dealing with a lot and maybe still working through some things. And we're kind of just kind of reintroduced to some of these characters. And also Lindsay Wallace, uh, played by Kyle Richards, uh, she's running kind of the local watering hole, uh, the dive bar in town as well. So we see some interactions with her. But what we're uh, maybe starting with you, Tamika, what did you think of kind of this, the way that these characters were assembled in the new movie and kind of this new character of Corey in particular, because we end up spending like a lot of time with them. Okay. So I actually, this is a part of the movie that I actually liked. Um, I, I, I said, I wasn't aware of like the, the conversation behind the movie. So I'm learning a lot of this now, <laughs> just from <laughs> you and Scotty Poo telling me. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I wonder if that was maybe something that people found to be divisive because I can understand if you're expecting more Michael Myers, maybe that you, them just pivoting to this brand new character we've never met in two movies, you know, since we've had yeah, these two movies already. Um, and focusing so much on him, why that would kind of be jarring, but I really enjoyed it. And I think it's because we're getting a look at, you know, um, this it, it, the town and kind of the app, like what Michael has done to this town over, over you know, however many, however many years it's been, you know, collectively. And it was just really tragic to start the movie off with his character and the accident because I remember he mentions to the parents, oh, I'm saving up, I'm babysitting because I want to, you know, take this money and use it because I'm saving up to go to college. And he's just planning out this whole future for himself. And I just, I know so many of us have done that. And you just have like so much of your future in your mind. You're just planning it all out and you're excited. And then not what, two, three hours later, all of that just gets pulled away from you, you know, because it's, it's clearly, you know, a tragedy. Um, Yeah. You know, what happens to the little boy and to watch that. Oh, that hurt. I was like, Oh, it's true. To be fair, to be fair though, uh, the little shit had it coming. Uh, you know, okay. He was you know, pretty obnoxious. He was he, a pretty was. obnoxious little kid. <laughs> and uh I it's, I almost yeah. j- jumped out of my seat and cheered right no just way. at that no. opening. I did no. because no, I'll tell you why because 
what the hell kind of start is that for a movie for a Halloween movie? I and, know, then, I know. and then it cuts to the font for Halloween three. And that's when I knew. Oh, like, yeah. OK, it's going we're going to be dealing yep. with. I think um, some of the legacy of not only the Halloween franchise, but but John Carpenter himself. Yeah. And, and that's kind of peppered throughout the movie i think but just if we're just right now talking about that opening alone i thought it was uh really well done and mm -hmm. and unexpected yes. and mm -hmm. it did for me it kind of um it kind of made me feel like i i was paying even just a little more attention to this movie because i thought okay we might be doing something we might be trying something different here you know, uh, so my interest was once I mean, with Halloween Kills, once uh, Halloween Kills starts and you understand what that movie is going to be and you just appreciate it for what it is. It's amazing. And and but this one throws a curveball for you, because with that opening, you don't know what's coming next. You just don't. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because it would have been really easy for them to incorporate Michael Myers himself in that opening as like his grand return. But instead it's like the shadow of Michael Myers and which kind of goes into this whole theme of the movie about how like Michael shadow is over this entire town and just seeing like the knife missing from the kitchen Island or like when something getting locked into an attic room while playing hide and seek that initiates this panic because you think, oh, Michael's in the house and I can't find the kid. And so even though Michael's not even there, it's like he's already just influencing these characters. And we see that more and more with Corey, of course, as he almost becomes like possessed by Michael to some extent or like just at least falling under that influence. But even before we see Michael in the movie, we already feel his presence, even though he's not there, which I think it's really interesting that they it was so restrained compared to like the in your face, Michael of Halloween kills. Well, yeah, it's it's setting you up and I bought it. Um, I totally went for it. I thought it was they were setting you up for a Michael kill, right, for a Michael mm -hmm. return. And then it pulls the rug uh, out from under you. And I thought, whole. I mean, it's kind it's kind of a take on the the Halloween kills. Um uh, um nurse nurse uh, the doctor in the nurse uniform with the gun who ends up shooting herself in the Ooh, face when yeah. he kicks the car door open you know it's kind of like a play on that with of course but with the consequences being much more tragic and and far-reaching right yep absolutely and it's interesting that they spend that much time in the opening it's with a new character. It kind of sets the stage for the direction the entire movie is going to take as far as like really spending a lot of time with Corey. But I thought it, it, you know, his performance just kind of sucked me in right away where it felt like, yeah, like you said to me, you could feel all this hope that he had for his future just go down the drain. So then when we see him later in the film and we see him come back and start working at the junkyard, it's like you have this kind of sympathy for this character. And on top of that, you it's almost like you get to see him then intermingle with Laurie Strode and Allison. And so you almost see those characters a little bit from a different perspective as he starts to engage again with the town and Allison tries to like pull him out of the shell. But uh, it's yeah, it's a very interesting thing. Also, if you uh, that that shocking death in that opening kind of reminiscent of a really intense scene from uh, Z by Brandon Christensen. So definitely if you mm -hmm. like that opening, I would recommend checking that film out, but also very shocking. Uh, but yeah, just going into, I guess, kind of past that that shocking opening, which, yeah, the theater just kind of went um, was very very uh, shocked by that moment when we were watching that. That got a lot of gasps in the audience. But then we then we get to see that uh, Laurie Strode is living with Allison in the same house. They're both, you know, obviously grieving um, Judy Greer's character who was killed at the end of Halloween Kills. And we but we see that. I don't know. It felt like this was a much sunnier side of Laurie. Like 
she seemed way more hopeful than I've seen her like almost since the original film. Cause even in like the H2O timeline, she obviously was, you know, dealing with alcoholism and that one. And, and, Mm -hmm. but, and, and Halloween 2018, she's very sheltered kills. She's very like pissed off, you know, Mm -hmm. and understandably so, but this one is like, it kind of felt like she was, it was just such a different side of her. Yeah. She had, she was, she was trying to, and again, it's one of the, um, as you mentioned, it's one of the themes of the movie. It's how evil uh, affects us and, and how can we move past it, right? And she's she's bought a house for her and Allison uh, uh, to live in. Um, she seems happy. She's quit drinking. She runs into Frank, uh, oh, at, Frank. The, at the grocery store. Them. Oh, I love uh, that. Right. And Whoa. she's, you know, flirting like a schoolgirl. Um, oh, it's face. just the just the sweetest thing. Um, so yeah, it's when we meet Lori, she's in, you know, uh, she's in a much better place, uh, or or is trying to be in a much better place. Um, but yeah, she and then she um and again. Okay, you you continue the narrative, uh, Derek, and because there's weird some weird events happen as in they do in all these movies, and it's it's uh, also a shame that our comrade Brian is not here uh, <laughs> to comment because we had a lot to love together with with kills, and there's a lot of the same kind of just odd uh, writing uh, in in yes. this one as well, just odd. Uh, not bad necessarily, but just strange, right? So, but continue the narrative, and and when these things pop up, we'll we'll uh, we'll pop in with them. All right, we'll do. And yeah, and also on that note of of Lori and Frank in the supermarket, like that, I could totally just see a Hallmark movie with those two characters. That would be so much fun just to see those characters have like just a nice movie together. Um, so that. <laughs> That is a such a sweet moment in the movie bef- before things get a little darker. Before things uh, go sideways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yes, as uh, as David Gordon Green, the director, and um, his his co-writer, Dan McBride, um, and also Chris uh, Bernier and Paul Brad Logan, also credited as writers on, on this installment, they keep you guessing as the movie goes on um, because we see... Uh, Corey basically starts working at this uh, like junkyard and his boss turns out to be, I think it's like his stepdad. Yeah. I think it's his stepdad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and we see Corey's home life is not the greatest. He's got a very like smothering mother who's like straight out of like psycho smother. Yeah. There's like a total like Bates, Bates motel, like psycho element going Mm -hmm. on there. But even, even like over the top though, in like a very like Danny McBride way with some of the the moments with the mom and, and yeah. Corey. And, uh, but we see um, that Corey is kind of bullied uh, by a Haddonfield's <laughs> residents. Yeah. He's... By, again. Okay. This is again. And I, and I was setting that up before because this I'll raise my hand right away. Yeah. Corey, who just from a guesstimate seems to be like a fairly, good sized fella, a decent sized fella. He doesn't looks about like five ten, five eleven, whatever. Yes, he's getting bullied by uh some guys from the marching band. <laughs> this oh, this gang of this that. gang of marching band guys are his bullies. Up on yeah. that. Uh yeah. It- it's another interesting choice because it I is. mean the the trope, of course, with with movies, um, is that you know the bullies are always these jock characters. You know they're you know they're football players or they're you know it's it's always like a certain type of character, but then they very like aggressively go in this other direction and and keep showing you like how they're like members of like the marching band or the pet band. I mean, and come on, man. With the drumsticks. Like, and it's, that's really sad if the marching band is beating the snot out of you. It, they're really, I mean, they're setting you up as very much a loser. I mean, I think in that 
think very much that's the point, you know, it's just kind of of kicking him while he's down. Oh, totally. Yeah. But again, that's, that comes across as a McBride thing. Like, well, let's make them the marching, let's make it the marching band guys, you know, Mm -hmm. like. I'd rather get beat by like the marching band, honestly, than like a Stephen King level bully. (laughs) They just seem like psychopaths. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yes. True. King bullies. But yes, again, when Lori go the extra mile, yeah. But like when Lori rescues him at the gas station from the marching band, and then like, why would she cut their tires? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Lori goes she, hardcore. She's she gets, not messing she around. She gets him. She gets him. She gets him from getting his ass kicked, and then decides, you know what? Let's do something that may piss them off even more and will certainly guarantee you an ass kicking. Let's, let's slash your tires. You're welcome. It's kind of, it's kind of amazing because as we see later in the movie, like her actions in that moment kind of propel the rest of the story forward in the direction that it goes. Oh, totally. No, it's, that is the, that's ground zero. That's, that's the moment that sets the whole chain in, in motion, right? That, that that sets it all off and just be like why would she do it i like there's just like we said there's odd there's just odd choices are going on so i think and, oh well no go for it go for it so about that i sensed this like theme throughout the movie that i i i completely understand it but i just felt like it was telegraphed instead of like yeah, yeah, that's that's the writing, I suppose. It's just telegraphed. It's like, Lori, this is your fault. Like when um, she's at the grocery store and she runs into, I think it's the sister of the black lady who got attacked by Michael in Halloween Kills. She's like, it's all your fault. You know, she can't, you know, talk now because of you. And, and there's a lot of that because I think Allison says something to her later, you know, like this is all your fault like my friends died it's your fault and so i just feel like that's just like kind of oh it's not subtle there's nothing no not at all there's nothing subtle about it you know it's not it's not ingmar bergman Uh, um, (laughs) (laughs) it's a guy in a fucking hockey mask so true um no william shatner mask now scott (laughs) you're right right. that's right yeah yeah Yeah, don't don't mix up my poo and and michael myers don't do that to jason don't 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 do that well i'm sure you know hopefully one day soon we'll be talking about the new uh friday the 13th trilogy oh, or something please. like that but we'll, it just have to, existence. <laughs> we'll just have to, in the meantime we'll just have to wait and and revisit halloween ends and yeah and and uh some other interesting horror movies coming out soon but uh going back to you know the the bullies uh we see you know, Corey gets this uh, like uh, glass in his hand from that encounter at the gas station. So he goes to the hospital where he meets Allison and again, kind of playing a key part in how this story moves forward. Lori kind of sets up her granddaughter with Corey. And it seems like Allison has already had this like kind of infatuation with Corey. Like she, it seems like she knows she like knows who he is. She can empathize with his backstory of like everyone in the town looking at him a certain way. And so they kind of like, she kind of uh, pursues him, you know, romantically. Yeah, they, they, sh- they shorthand it to get, to get, to move that plot line along. They really uh, shorthand it. And, and again, Tamika to, to your point that goes back to ta-da, the writing. Um, and I know that's a, that's a complaint that people have about this movie is because you're bringing in this new character, Corey Cunningham, uh, it's shortchanging other elements uh, of the film. But I would disagree with that. I would say having Corey there actually amplifies the point of the movie is that evil uh isn't a person evil continues evil is in our deeds and our actions and it's in how we treat people and and it's how we ourselves are uh you know are treated so i think that 
has has a big part um, to do with it. And that's why evil can never truly die tonight. Although, I mean, always, we're in spoiler, we're in spoiler territory, though, right? But we won't talk about the ending. Okay. Yet. Well, we're not we're not uh, we're not there yet. We're still in. What are we in? So Corey, so Corey starts getting yes. busy. Yes. So Corey and Allison end up kind of on their uh, early on that, you know, they start dating. They realize they have this connection. Corey is kind of reluctant at first, but he kind of realizes that they do have a genuine connection kind of based on how the town treats them, even though, you know, she's looked at as a survivor, he's looked at as a killer. And there's a really interesting line too, where Corey's mom tells Lori, um, like your boogeyman died. So like the town needed a new one. And that's what my son has become paraphrasing there a little bit. But so it's almost like he's kind of looked at as like the next Michael Myers in some ways. Um, but so they start dating um, early on in their relationship. They go to a costume party uh, at the bar where, that is run by none other than Lindsay Wallace, who has survived uh, several encounters with Michael Myers at this point and is now um, operating this dive bar in town. So we get some uh, some time with Lindsay Wallace there. And but of course, uh, things don't go well for Corey for too long, because also at the party is the mother of the son that he accidentally killed uh, on Halloween night several years prior. So, it. you know, oh, gosh, that's not what they mean when they say you'll stand up and cheer, Scott. <laughs> not moments like that. <laughs> But but I digress. Uh, so basically, the the party um, does not end well for Corey. He uh, kind of storms out of this costume party. Uh, Allison can't get him to calm down. He just needs some time on his own. Uh, and so he wanders off. And wouldn't you know it, On as he's walking down the side of the road, the marching band bullies pull up in their car as he's walking over a bridge and they have another encounter, which is also a little more amplified because Lori slashed their tires, but of course, or, or at least, you know, wanted Corey to do that. And so now they're even more ticked off and it, you know, Corey takes out a knife that he's got to try and protect himself with, but things, you know, don't go as planned and he ends up getting, kind of pushed over the side of this bridge and then falls below in this kind of like grassy gravelly area down below, um, which is right by a sewer opening. So we have this like water discharge pipe that has this opening to it. Um, it's kind of like a, there is like a homeless en encampment down there. And we see Corey very creepily as he's knocked out, get pulled into a drain pipe. And then we see this movie enter a new phase because it almost feels very Pennywise like at this point, because the person that pulls him in there is none other than back, Michael back, Myers. Back again, again, again. So. Look who's back, 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 back again, again, again. And is it not incredibly in fact effective when he does appear after the grousing from people about it's been an hour where is he when he shows up it means something it really right. does to me it does it, it uh it it just it like you said it kicked the movie into into another gear and then you thought well where's and again you thought where is this gonna go What's going to be happening here? Is this going to be Jason goes to hell? And the answer is, yes, it is. But it's other things as well. Yes and no at the same time, uh, because we see uh, Corey wake up in this uh, this kind of big open room in the sewers. And as he's leaving, Michael Myers lunges out with one hand kind of through this opening in the wall and he grabs Corey by the throat and they have this really uh, like intimate connection where Michael Myers is looking through his very like decomposed moldy mask 
because presumably he's like been living in the sewer for years ever since Halloween kills. And there's like all these like flashes of like Michael Myers violence, like subliminal messages almost. And we see Corey and him just kind of staring at each other. And it's, it definitely feels like there's like a vibe or like an energy or something's going on there in this moment. And it's a little ambiguous, but they also kind of show you enough to make you think that something potentially is going on there. Yeah. My thought was that my thought was that Michael was saw what the, the, I almost said the T word that Michael, um, that Corey, he, he sees what Corey has experienced, what Corey's been through the pain that Corey's been through. And at that moment, because of that, he gives him some power some evil power maybe maybe i don't know that, i don't know maybe that's... <laughs> yeah that's a isn't that kind of the storyline of halloween four or five remember yes with jamie lloyd yeah. played by daniel harris at the end of yeah, four yeah. yep yeah and they like touched her and then they had like a like they kind of like connected i guess psychically or mentally or however you want to say it that just, that I, just hit me. <laughs> good on you. I was I wasn't that would have flown right over me completely. Good catch it, there. Because we we saw like Jamie after at the end of four very creepily stabs like her stepmom with scissors in the clown mm -hmm. costume, and even though they kind of went away from that a little bit in five, like there still showed that there was a connection there because she knew like when. Michael was about to kill somebody. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I feel like I, they kind of. But again, but again, that was for like a, that was for familial reasons, right? Right. That was yeah, her. Yeah, it was Uncle Mike. This oh, is yeah. this is they have no, they have no connection. So I'm that was that's the only thing I can grasp onto is because they showed there was a flash of of uh, the accident where the kid who deserved it died. And no, uh, he did not. <laughs> And, oh, man. And, and, God, and that's when so Michael and that's when cake. Michael and that's when Michael released him. Woo. Right. Yes. See, OK. And so then all I of a sudden, Corey, you know, started having bad, bad thoughts. OK, this might be reaching, but hear Reach. me out. OK, mm -hmm. I do think they do have a connection because. OK, so. Michael as a child, right? Like there's something clearly not, you know, okay within him because even as a small child, he's, you know, killing his sister, right? So this is like this like murderous intent inside of him, right? From the beginning mm -hmm. or that is true. told. Yeah. So <laughs> then we, you know, so, so then we see Corey be the opposite of that. So he's like, everybody's like, oh, but he's such a good kid and he would never do this on purpose. And then he turns into a killer. Mm -hmm. So like, maybe that's how they're connected. Cause like, they're the inverse of each other. It's like, I personally, Michael doesn't feel, even though I know these movies, he, he kills and he kills hard, man, they are. Mm. But I don't know. I think over the years, some of the movies, he doesn't seem so okay. He he's bad. Tough. He's bad. But okay, let's say you ain't so he's tough, so mysterious, Mike. right? So the more <laughs> we get to know about him, the less mysterious he is. The more we understand him, right? And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. So he's not just pure evil, right? Like he's just a person. Like we see him unmasked. He's just a man right well no yeah. well it depends what timeline you're talking in because oh, that's that right. is true the multiverse yeah. is that's true there's the multi there's thorn, the Rob Zombie, not, which is a very grounded thorn, version thorn he's very supernatural yep. um this one in kills they hint of a supernatural and in this right. one they clearly do uh as well it it's yep it's not only it's not only a um a metaphor 
uh, for evil permeating the town. There is, I think there is a palpable and actual uh, evil to do with this town because Laura, they, they talk about it in the movie, in Laurie's voiceover. She talks about how in the years following Michael, yes, yes. no one, no one's been the same and that people are, there's a bitterness and there's a, you know, and it, a it, there's just, there's a, there's you know? a, there's yes. like a, there's a, and there's a, but there's a pall over, over the, the town as well. That yeah, it, it's, true. it seems you know, when he disappeared uh, four years ago after, you know, they evil dies tonight, but he still kicked their ass. Um, the normalcy, I think, is I think is uh, kind of dampened by by the dourness, um, which Laurie is trying to to break through, which I again, I mm -hmm. think is is a kind of a not profound but a really cool thing about this movie is, is it's it um it's about finding optimism in 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 a shitstorm it's about mm -hmm. finding your way through something uh that's impossible uh to get through and and i think even though some have complained that introducing Corey into this is a little bit of a too little too late it should have been done earlier blah 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 uh, um i i just don't agree with that i think Corey being there um again i think it needed it because if when we get this halloween ends uh on on uh in home release um like say on and i can hold it in my hand and i can i can run all three movies Mm -hmm. I think ends is I think ends is going to play. I think and I hope it's going to play better uh, for people at home because uh, kills is so frenetic and, and frantic that yeah. I I think some people when this one came out it's a year after and it starts off it doesn't start off like that it's it's more of a measured pace for for a good portion uh of the movie and i think people were expecting that still frenetic rush of kills uh but there's a year in between so that's different but i think if you're watching the trilogy at home uh kills is going to play as this locomotive out of control uh you know slash fest and then um ends is going to have that breathing room for you to slow down and mm -hmm. and and see where these characters are and i think it's going to play i think it's going to play so much better for people i hope when when they watch them uh you know consecutively because i think what they were ultimately trying to do i think i think they pulled off i think this does uh stick the landing hmm. it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to watch all three of them together for the first time because that you you almost do have to look at it as like as a single movie but also in its relation to the the new trilogy as a whole and just how it fits into that puzzle and like the themes of each movie and the whole arc of the three movies which is different than that's that's what's so like almost hard about evaluating a halloween movie is like its place within like such a long storied franchise and and Laurie Strode's arc. And now I think that's why a lot of people like, you know, Corey is a little difficult for people to kind of get on board with, because like you say, it's some people are saying, well, it's too late in the game. Like this should be more about Laurie. But I feel like like the way Corey, his arc happens in this movie, it kind of everything about it is also it has to do with Lori as well. And we see her change throughout the movie and how she is able to kind of come to terms with, with finally once and for all facing Michael and, and in, you know, a winner takes all death match one last time. Like he's kind of the whole propulsion of that. So I think it, it's a little, it took some getting used to, but I, I like, I like it more than I didn't like it. But I think, uh, and you know, on the Corey note, so we we have going back to our uh, 
our journey through the plot here. We have Corey has just emerged from the sewer after this like intimate moment with Michael, maybe transferring some, maybe or maybe not transferring some type of evil telepathically. Like they do kind of leave that a little ambiguous and which is kind of interesting because I think you can all kind of have your own viewpoint on that. And no one's really a hundred percent wrong because it's all in how you look at Corey psychologically and everything like that. Um, but things do not go well as soon as he emerges from the sewer. Like he immediately ends up kind of accidentally um, killing uh, the homeless guy who was living there and saw him emerge from the sewer. Like once again, the knife comes out and uh, it, unfortunately he ends up uh, killing this man who kind of confronts him right away. And from there, uh, the, this new kind of murder spree happens where we see Corey start to change psychologically where he's he seems to almost like start to embrace the self-fulfilling prophecy of of how Haddonfield views him as a killer so he's almost like okay fine I'm going to be a killer then and he starts to uh take down all these people that have looked at him or looked down on him uh since uh that that tragic accident and uh, so soon after he kills the homeless man, um, he ends up kind of luring Allison's ex-boyfriend, um, who is this police officer, Doug Mullaney. Um, and he kind of ruined one of their dates when he, he came up and was interfering with their conversation. Um, we see this uh, police officer follow uh, Corey on his motorcycle, which he's been riding throughout the film and that motorcycle is almost like a character in itself in this movie. It's, it, it, it uh, it's, it reminds you of like Christine with uh, the car. And, and it's almost like, I remember David Gordon green saying like when he handed the script to uh, John Carpenter for Halloween ends, he, I remember somewhere I saw that he had mentioned, like, I hope it's not too much like Christine. And I can kind of see <laughs> some similarities there now that watching Halloween ends, but what's really interesting with uh, uh, with Allison's ex-boyfriend is that now we see Corey kind of lure him back into the sewer where he knows that Michael is waiting. And not only does Corey help murder Doug, but he like kind of encourages Michael to stab him to death. And almost like you can see as Michael is killing Doug that he's like, it's awakening this this like desire to kill in him because he was really like beaten down and just seemed to like be barely surviving. But as soon as he kills Doug and Corey helps him, he like gets that second wind back, or maybe it's like the 20th wind at this point, <laughs> but uh, he gets that wind back. And then from there, uh, you know, Corey and Michael, he, you know, Corey gets Michael out of the sewers and kind of like unleashes him on the town. So that is uh, another kind of big twist of this movie is that Corey is almost like learning how to kill from Michael. And like Michael is kind of this kind of like mentor to Corey. And we see it's like it's like the uh, Michael Myers apprentice or something. It's very interesting watching that unfold. But uh, what what did uh, what did both of you think of of kind of like seeing Michael like working with somebody and and having like like a like a second like an assistant or something like that when he was killing people in this movie yeah that i i just i was like uh are you talking about the, um that the the dentist guy like the the jerk dentist oh guy? well first the the police officer that um i guess it was implied that like allison had dated him and like he oh, followed right. Corey. okay okay yes i remember okay okay but then, yes, yes, then the doctor and the nurse at the doctor's house are their next victims. And that's when we really see them team up. I which could was like, not, whoa. I, yes. I was like, wait, what? Because like when he looked at that clown mask in Allison's room, I thought, uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. And then to, to see them, I mean, I, I had a feeling it was going to happen because when their first encounter in the sewer and the pipes or the sewer. That is a huge sewer. It had like, I need oh. some excellent mood lighting. <laughs> yeah, Michael had style in there. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean, atmosphere. 
nice work, Michael, with the interior design. Um, I had a feeling. I thought, okay, he let him live for a reason. So they must, they're going to like team up or I don't know what in the hell is going to happen. So when then it finally happened, I thought, oh my God, it was, it was done so well, but it was still odd because I'm like, Michael having like a teammate, like a sidekick. (laughs) (laughs) It was so weird, but. Or a protege. Yeah. Because really, I mean, it, to me, it felt like uh, the, you know, the evil must continue. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and um, it, as time goes, as time goes on, there has to be, there has to be evil, right. If there's going Mm -hmm. to be good, there's got to be, a uh, counter to that and there has to mm-hmm. be evil so i think it was i think it was to me it played like a transfer of uh a changing of the guard a transfer of power a transfer of office uh, <laughs> um New a, a, a passing of the butcher knife <laughs> passing of the butcher knife a, <laughs> take your serial killer to work day you know um <laughs> it was kind of it was it was kind of it was kind of like that and again at this point in the movie, uh, I just had a big smile on my face because I'm like, what is this? This is not something you would normally see in a Halloween movie. Uh, um, uh, but I thought it was so well done and the idea so intriguing that I just went along with it. And um, yeah, there you go. It, it yeah. is it's interesting because you don't like i'm used to seeing like two ghost face killers in a screen movie but like michael working you know with somebody and i guess you know I, I, now that i think about it in in the 2018 halloween we had dr sartain kind of wanting to work with michael but instead mm-hmm. of he was like no i'm just actually going to like kill you instead and and so like michael wanted none of it then but now it's almost like yeah, maybe he senses something in Corey where it just feels right to him, or he's just so much closer to death where he's like, okay, well, there, I can. There's roll there's with that this. too. There's that too, right? Because they do they do point out uh, in in a few scenes that Michael ain't what he used to be. Um, he's still got some moves, but that he is slowing down, uh, you know, considerably. You know, when you have to kind of uh, hang around the sewers in the hopes of, you know, getting a victim, he's getting he's getting older and his power is waning, um, as it were. And uh, teaming up, however you want to put it, teaming up with uh, tag teaming with Corey, um, like I said, gives him an opportunity to I don't it plays like a training montage almost, but uh not so much train him but um show him how to do good evil i guess you know Mm -hmm. right like um it's just there's so many stephen king like connections Mm -hmm. too because it feels Mm -hmm. very much like it right because yes the whole point is that like you know pennywise or it right it's like just put this horrible like just fog over the town of Derry, right and he's changing the people there and they're just like so violent and just like like mobby you know it just like in in Haddonfield and then you have you know it hanging out like living in the sewer right sewer system under the town here you have Michael I guess like you know needing to recharge and a little break he's he's had a couple <laughs> breaks you know he needs them like we all do like you know let his hair down so he's hanging out in the sewers just like i really it, like this the the stephen king level bullies i'm loving right? it. it 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 does feel a lot like dairy like haddonfield feels like dairy in this like not just this movie but like halloween kills and i guess you know halloween 2018 to some extent mm-hmm. like it's really about the town as much as it is as it is about Michael and how like having something so horrible happen in your town can affect it like through the generations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like they have their very own boogeyman and it it's they're like haunted by him, even when 
he's not there or they always think he's there. And so it definitely, yeah, it definitely has that Stephen King vibe. And like just having Michael in the sewer is so on the nose Pennywise that mm -hmm. like they had to have known <laughs> what they were doing with that. Like, <laughs> yeah, I love that so, so much. Yeah. Like that is just so knowing, you know? I just wish that like it would be great if like Michael had taken the time to put like an Alice Cooper poster up in the sewer <laughs> wall or something like he had just decorated it a little bit like, you know, just put some, you know, made it his own a little bit more, but it, it's very oh, interesting. Yeah. Some wallpaper, a floor lamp. <laughs> just a good oh. vibe, you know, but yeah. so we, we see after, you know, Corey kind of reignites this passion for killing in michael or gets him gets him uh feeling good enough to leave the sewer um like you you had mentioned to mika they go to the doctor's house and he ends up killing the doctor and allison's co-worker um stabbing her kind of in a very similar way to bob um in the original film by pinning her to the wall uh so that was a nice uh connection or callback to the original film and that was like you know, it was really interesting just seeing those Corey and Michael working together in that scene where she thinks uh, she escaped the killer. And then it turns out, um, you know, the the original killer is standing right behind her. So uh, we see that, you know, Corey at this point, I, who knows if he's like entirely possessed or if he's just kind of succumbed to his demons within himself and is, you know, just using Michael to get back at the town. Like there's a lot of interpretations to come away from this movie with. Um, but one way or another, Laurie Strode is starting to catch on that something isn't quite right with Corey because uh, when he wakes up, I believe he's like spending the night at the house where uh, the accident occurred and she's like total badass mode, just like sitting in a chair like watching him, like just waiting for him to wake up. And she kind of like now, instead of Matt, you know, just days after um, setting her granddaughter up with Corey, she's telling him like, Hey, just stay away from Allison. Like something isn't right with you anymore. Like, you know, we don't want any part of it. And now we start to see like this other side of Lori, this more familiar side of Lori come out again, where she is, she's got to get back into hero mode and she, you can kind of tell she, you know, instead of moving on, like forcing herself to move on, she's kind of gearing up to confront all of this one more time. And it felt like, it just felt like a really cool, like almost like a poker table moment where she's like, I know that I don't know exactly what you've got in your hand, but I know you, you know, something's up your sleeve and things are not going to end well. If you, if you come near Allison again. And again, like you like you mentioned, it's <laughs> uh, it's so truncated, like one minute she's introducing them to each other, wanting them to get together. And then it seems like literally it feels like literally like a day later, or two days later, she's like standing over him going, stay the hell away from my granddaughter. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but again, you know, um, it's not there's it wants the movie wants to get a lot of ideas across i don't think it it has not at, at not at an hour 50 it has the space to uh to cover them all but i think the stuff that doesn't seep out um the sides and 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 what is left is is a solid tale about uh overcoming uh shit in your life uh, um and that it's always going to be there i think is another important uh thing the movie has a bit of a realist streak in it right it's like yeah there's always going to be a boogeyman there's always going to be a michael myers or a Corey cunningham it's how do you face that it's what do you do with that that uh determines where you go mm -hmm. beautifully yes. said that that is in, that because we all have our own boogeyman right like we all have mm -hmm. sure stuff that yeah, you know absolutely. we have to face and you know thankfully it doesn't always manifest itself as michael myers but i feel like they're in this trilogy new trilogy they're kind of like 
Michael Myers is almost like as metaphorical as he is literal in some ways where just the way that he haunts like the, the psychology and, you know, the kind of stuff that you would hear like Dr. Loomis, you know, talking about in one of his epic monologues where it's like, you know, he, he just kind of like sticks with the person. And in this case, uh, the entire town, you know, is haunted by him. And, you know, it's definitely Halloween kills, you know, didn't, you know, that confrontation didn't quite work out for, uh, you know, Tommy Doyle and the townspeople that faced him. But uh, I feel like they're a little more prepared to take him on in this one or Michael's just more weakened as well, um, because after uh, Lori warns Corey to stay away from Allison, Corey ends up going back to the sewers where. Michael went back there to like take a power nap or something like that. And in a really like <laughs> kind of fascinating scene, uh, Corey like takes, like literally wrestles him, like has this very like physical confrontation with Michael and takes Michael's mask away from him. Like that is, I mean, just think of like just so many layers that like, that's the last thing you'd ever want to try to do with a, you know, a murderer in, in one of these horror movies and it's so like for Michael, that's got to be like a just it's such like a disrespectful move. Like, you know, like <laughs> the, here's this like young hot shot. He's going to come in and take my place. And it, now you see this relationship go from like mentor and mentee to like Corey's like, OK, you know, OK, old man, get out of my way. Like I'm going to I'm like yanking the butcher blade and the torch out of your hand because yeah. I can, I want this now and I can do it better than you. And so it's a very like sad scene in a way, even though like Michael has also done just horrible things. Like it's a very, I don't know. It's very emotionally com uh, complex what's going on there. For you, apparently, apparently you're quite <laughs> yeah. saddened that, <laughs> that Michael Myers got beat up. Hey, you know what they say? You'll, you'll laugh, you'll cry, <laughs> you'll, you'll stand up and cheer. But uh, maybe not in a Halloween movie. That's maybe that's what not what it is expected. Well, but. You're crying. I'm standing up and cheering. I mean, we're covering a lot of emotions with this movie. It's got it all, folks. I'm telling you, it, it really does. Um, it really does. So now we enter the kind of this third act of the movie where, OK, we've seen Corey, you know, be sympathetic, you know, be sympathetic. We've seen him wrestle with his demons and now after quite literally wrestling with michael in the sewer we see him kind of embrace becoming like the new michael the new boogeyman and now he's on his own michael myers rampage and we we see him uh basic well then we see this epic uh showdown with the marching band bullies at the junkyard where Corey's stepfather works and Unfortunately, Corey's stepfather gets caught in the crossfire and ends up getting, well, literally caught in the crossfire because he accidentally gets shot by one of the marching band bullies. But mm -hmm. in a very like Christine type scenario, like we see Corey um, kill the marching band bullies using um, like a truck to kind of trap them. And then in, you know, probably maybe the most vicious kill of the movie he uses like a welding torch and it's kind of like blurred off camera but you see him like stick it in the mouth of one of the bullies and just ignite it so that we get a little bit of that halloween kills energy at this point in the movie and it's it's very uh it's very intense and uh none of these bullies make it out alive uh the stepfather is unfortunately killed and then after this um we see uh, oh, yes. He also goes to the radio DJ station where he then kills the radio DJ and um, and the uh, the woman at the front desk and uh, who's played by Darcy, right, from uh, from uh, Joe Bob. So that is a nice, a nice uh, appearance there, a good cameo. And I believe um, she had mentioned on Twitter that um, she had like an expanded death scene that will be in the bonus features. So another reason to get uh, the this when it comes out on home media. And also, I got to say the uh, the radio DJ death when they had like his tongue got cut out and was placed on the record player and like the record is skipping like a very like, you know, tongue in cheek um, 
moment there that I think uh, was a little bit of fun um, in, a, in otherwise a very kind of serious part of the movie. Uh, and from this moment on, it just now we enter kind of the 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 final stage, right, where we see, you know, Corey has killed all these people that he felt had wronged him throughout the movie. And we see Lori back at home alone because her and Allison got in this big argument and Allison basically just wants to leave Haddonfield. She wants to just move on literally to another phase of her life. And Lori is home alone and court and she kind of, this is where it's really interesting and, and very somber too, is that we see like they set it up, making it look like Lori is going to commit suicide. She's, she starts drinking again. She um, calls in a suicide to the police. And then we see that she's not alone. The door starts to open and Michael or who we think is Michael is staying in the doorway. And Lori says something along the lines of, do you really think I would have, I was going to kill myself. She shoots him. And lo and behold, though, it is Corey wearing the Michael Myers mask. And now we see the the showdown everyone bought the tickets for begin because now Michael Myers enters the picture, reclaims that mask, and enters this final brawl with Laurie Strode. And it's, you know, it's kind of interesting because it all happens so quickly, like in this final act where it's a I really like the way it's choreographed and it felt very believable, but like this final match between Lori and Michael ends up being it, it's you know it, it's it's a big kind of uh intimate fight in the kitchen but it's like it, it once it gets going it's like hold on and then it's before you know it, it it's over so it's but it's interesting how they did that yeah and it's really i i thought it was well done too and it's again it's a smaller scale uh i mean you get you gets what you pay for halloween kills <laughs> that movie is literally people just being killed left, right, and center. Uh, Halloween ends, you know, this one has, when all is said and done, kind of, um, I don't, I'm not even going to say bittersweet because it doesn't have a uh, bittersweet when it gets to the resolution, but this, this final showdown between Lori and Michael, um, uh, I buy it because, They've already shown us that Michael is getting weaker. Uh, so physically, it feels a little more even handed. I mean, am I going to be the the uh, the judge of what level strength Michael still has at 65 and what Lori has at 62 or some horseshit like that? No, I don't. It's a movie. Lighten up, Francis. Um, it's a good fight. And I. And I really dig the way uh, that she skewers him to the uh, kitchen table, to the island, uh, and then does what um, something very smart and something and, and, and killing him in a way that we haven't seen them do before, which is bleed him out. I like their thinking here, and and Lori does just that with the throat, the jugular, the uh, vascular, and the uh, one other place. This bad, and uh, I really like that um, because again, it it has more of an intimate uh, feel to it than um, him being surrounded by by eighty people. Right. It's like he's bleeding out on this table and they, you slowly see her her cut and you see him slowly start to to bleed out. And it's a really. It's kind of like, you know, when you watch a scene in a movie of like a surgery and you don't know how the surgery is going to go for the patient, it's kind of like that because you're thinking in your head, yeah, he's bleeding out. But his name is also Michael, last name Myers. And lo and behold, there's that great um, there's that great jump of when his hand comes through the knife and oh. grabs her by the throat. 
And because I think, I think David Gordon Green has been really good at instilling a uh, relentlessness to to Michael over this series. And again, crucial to that, I think, is is that middle installment of Halloween Kills, where it's pure adrenaline. This one is way more measured, and and because it's slowed down and more measured coming off of that, I think it hits that much harder that's a great scene the bloodletting uh in the kitchen it becomes a family affair it becomes uh this is a gathering of us taking down our collective boogeyman which it very much becomes because then they're not done they strap him to the top of the truck like uh like a an eight point and uh <laughs> And take him to the scrapyard, and uh, it become it's a procession. It's a procession mm-hmm. for this town, for this whole community to put this all behind them, and they really do end the end Michael Myers because uh, they load him to the top of a what is that? That's a, is that a uh, a tree thrash thresher is that i think it was like what they use to break down the cars to like break the down the cars industrial okay. shredder the industrial yep. shredder for the cars right sorry uh and we they didn't watched, go fargo with it quite they, but <laughs> they and they lay michael down and they they part and Lori, because it is um she's the one who gets to 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 make this right uh, even mm-hmm. though everyone in the town is pretty much hating her uh, at every return, um, they know it's not her. They know that she needs to put this boogeyman down for mm-hmm. all of them. And when she rolls him into that that shredder, and <laughs> you actually see him being ground up, uh, you kind of go, "I, without question, that's very that's dead." that's quite dead that's not that's even more dead <laughs> and yes there can be more dead that's more dead than having uh your head chopped off with an axe mm-hmm. and against uh, a tree it's more and dead. I'm, as long as she didn't leave the kitchen and let the paramedics check him out first and then they brought him to the junkyard <laughs> oh my but, gosh right. if they don't don't do that <laughs> <gasps> that oh, would, could be, you that would be beautiful. Halloween be beautiful. ends for real. I'm like, no, you bet. No switching around. No. But it's, you know, what I also really enjoyed um, about this movie is, is the um, little tips to uh, the original movie or some of the other movies uh, in the series. It, 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 uh, it comes across not as as tacky when it's done here, but as more of a form of uh, as tribute. It doesn't play as like some cheap meta or nostalgia ploy. You know, it feels like mm-hmm. they're while they're making this, they decided while they're making this movie, they're also just going to put in some nice little moments uh, for everyone who loves these movies like we do. Right. And this whole idea of the Halloween character of Michael Myers and 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 everything that we celebrated about it. And I think having the movie end, if it had not ended with Laurie surviving and having a chance at happiness, there would have been very large problems for everyone. Uh, Nobody across the spectrum from the people who loved it to the people who hated it would have gone for that. It would have been, it would have been disastrous. And I think the way that they set it up that um, she has another chance at happiness with Frank, a fellow survivor in what, as you notice at the, by the end of the movie is this very brightly colored, uh, uh, Haddonfield, uh, where they're sitting on a step talking about cherry blossoms. 
And Mm -hmm. my heart just, my heart grew like three sizes. I thought, you know what? That's the ending that I want for Laurie Strode. And I got it. So I'm a happy camper. Others who didn't, uh, weren't satisfied with that. I'm sorry. Um, but personally myself, I'm more than satisfied with, uh, uh, how Lori uh, ended up. I, I totally yeah. understand, you know, wanting to see Lori happy because I, even though I'm not the biggest fan of this franchise, I've always been a really big fan of her character and her character arc arcs in the multiverse, in the Malton, in the Myers verse. But I got to say, if she did die, you know, if they died together, there'd have been something kind of poetic about that. And she would be at peace, you know, and I would be okay with that because I just, in the end, just want her to be happy. Even if that doesn't look like the happiness I would pick for her. Okay. I would be okay with that, you know, like in. So what you're saying is I'm the bad guy because I was cheering on a little kid being killed. And you're, a little but bit, you're a fine, little bit. but you're fine with Lori it's being little... killed. No, no, no. Because, okay. In the Myers verse, this has kind of already happened, right? Mm, what, what was that? True. Uh, yeah. How well did it? that go over? Resurrection. Resurrection. Yeah. Danger Resurrection it was, mm-hmm. and, you know, and it was, it was like, okay, if this is what she wants, then, okay, we have it. And we're gonna see where this goes now. So, yeah, you know, I think. Because we're always talking about connections, right? In these films and the connections that Michael has with Lori and her family, whether she wants that connection or not, there's a connection. And then the connections that Michael has with Haddonfield, whether they like that or not. So it would be kind of interesting to see like them put this fr- franchise to rest for real don't do a Halloween ends for real, you know, like five years from now, don't do that. <laughs> don't do it. Okay. It'd be well, you, interesting. Know, you know, you know what they, like, okay. they did after, uh, you know, oh, Friday the 13th, the final chapter that is, is they had a new beginning. So could we, and that is interesting because I almost say that half jokingly, but quite honestly, my dad pointed this out when, after we saw the movie is that last, uh, frame of the movie that last shot is of Michael Myers mask on the living room t- coffee table just sitting there and you know if you know if they you know this you know I'm sure we'll see another Halloween movie at some point I don't know if they would you know what direction they're going to go if they totally reboot it I mean it, it does feel like Laurie's story is done but if they want to continue and and not like completely reboot it it does seem like they could go the supernatural route and have someone else get the mask and kind of go through what Corey went through in this movie and just have like a totally new michael myers or maybe the mask just keeps showing up in different towns on halloween you know every year like across the world like i don't i it just feels like they left they just couldn't help but like leave the door open just a little bit there at the end with that mm-hmm. last shot of the mask. And, and honestly, they, you know, the way they handled Michael Myers and, you know, at, at t- in this new trilogy, like at times they made it seem like he was just a guy, but other times, like it seemed like he was supernatural, like he had mm-hmm. certain abilities. Like, so it does kind of make you wonder like how much of that is real and how much of that is like misdirection. Like it, it's, I think there's going to be a lot. People will debate like what really happened in these movies for years to come, because there is some ambiguity there. And I, I do feel like I am glad though, that with Lori, we at least got what feels like a full, like final chapter, like trilogy with her, where it does feel like, okay, you can, you know, end that story on a satisfying note. She does survive, which 
like you said, if we, we could always have resurrection for the other uh, ending where it's not quite as happy for her. <laughs> but, uh... I, I'll stick to this uh, multiverse. Thank you. I'm, I'm good Myers over here. Verse. I'm good he over here. He coined it. Myers verse. Copyright. I mean, copyright. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. For sure we're the first. Absolutely. <laughs> And, you know, and, and, um, and Annie Matichak, who did such a great job playing Allison, you know, she survives as well. She moves out of Haddonfield at the end. So, I mean, there's always a way, you know, I guess if they, if, if Lori really is done, I suppose there's always a way you could, you know, Allison could, uh, be like the new Michael Myers expert. It, maybe she comes back as like a Dr. Loomis, like in 20 years or, so, you know, 30, 40 years in, in a Halloween down the line, you know, or, so or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well you know yeah every, you know everything happens because so malika cod malika cod i think uh when he's done counting the receipts will go hmm and dish maybe we should have said <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's like like with friday the 13th the final chapter and you know also i should mention with you know fred you know the junkyard you know we saw michael myers you know torn to bits in a junkyard but you know freddy krueger was also resurrected in a junkyard by a dog that uh that pissed you know, on him that pissed yeah. on him so, on his burial ground so so again lighten up francis <laughs> <laughs> oh my god just they're just movies sorry man. francis we didn't Light mean to i know, meant it lighten up francis didn't mean there'd be so much, i didn't know there'd be so much francis slander <laughs> <laughs> well and if well, you know we, we don't we will stand for no francis around <laughs> these parts <laughs> sorry to all the francis is listening france i <laughs> It's totally not intentional. It's it's <laughs> it's not directed at you. Uh, but looking forward, though, I mean, we don't know what I mean. It, it looks like, you know, this the Blumhouse trilogy is done, um, you know, but, you know, the Halloween franchise lives on. And is there any like uh, it just feels like inevitable that at some point we're going to get another Halloween movie. So when you when both of you kind of look at the future of the of of these movies, like. Do you have a preferred direction you want them to go? Would you just want a totally new story? Like not even, you know, Michael Myers necessarily, or like, or you just like, I mean, maybe you go season of the witch, who knows? Like, or maybe someone else is wearing the mask, but is there anything you want to see in these movies going forward? Hmm. Cause it's tough because so much has been done, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, so much has been done. Like, <laughs> they're being like you know like related and not related and Lori has a kid and then like we get the rob zombie movies then we get this trilogy it, it's a lot so i don't really know i'm like oh i feel like so many interesting things have been you know done and then the cult the thorn or whatever i mean yes. we can't even go that route because that's been <laughs> well maybe hmm Okay, I'd like to see. Let... I'd like to see someone come at it, uh, maybe a little different aesthetically speaking. Maybe okay. some. Maybe something. Um, because content wise, I mean, how much different are you going to be? It's mm -hmm. Michael. It's still Michael Myers at the end of the day. So I. So I think maybe the approach. If the approach is different, if we got someone who came, uh, got away from the carpenter and and, and Gordon Green style of. Uh, that kind of cinematography and maybe do something different visually um, you know maybe something more akin to a European uh, style like an Argento or something like that I'm just um, it, it's kind of one of the reasons why I enjoy Freddy versus Jason because when Ronnie Yu came on oh, yeah. uh, it's it's not a movie that looks like an Elm Street movie and it's not a movie that looks like a Friday the 13th that has kind of a it gives everything a different appeal so I just think I'm not saying get Ronnie Yu although he's great um, but maybe maybe a different visual uh, uh, approach I would would make my eyes go a little wider. Yeah, I I would be interested to see just something new. I think, 
and I, you know, in a perfect world, you'd take enough time in between movies where everything felt fresh, where it just felt like the right time to come back with it. Because I sometimes a little breathing room is good. You don't want to over, you know, I mean, I, I'll, I'll take, I'll watch as many Halloween movies as they make. Don't get me wrong, but it does feel like maybe just really like figure out where to go, like take your time, you know, bring in some really different types of directors and, and like you said, different visions and, and mediums and really just play with the format and subvert expectations. Because I feel like this trilogy, they had a lot, they had a lot of creative freedom to do that, to like subvert some expectations, but there's even, I mean, outside of like the Lori Michaels story, there's so much uh, you can do with just slashers in general and the boogeyman and, and mythology of Halloween night and everything like that. So I, I would just like to see, I don't know, something even more out there, I guess, like go back to the season of the witch era where like, you really didn't know where the franchise was going to go next or the, or wait, like, you know, like think of like waiting 10 years and then you bring the return of Michael Myers. And it's like a huge thing because people it's like us waiting for Jason Voorhees after all these years. So it, I, I really am excited for whatever they do next. Uh, it's, I think this trilogy uh, mileage has varied with the fan base. Um, I think everyone, uh, I think a lot of people that liked Halloween 2018 um, maybe didn't necessarily enjoy Halloween ends, but like people that didn't like 2018 like ends. And then there's the, the Halloween kills diehards out there. So I, I feel like, you know, there was something for everyone in this, in this, these new films. And it was a good kind of sampler platter of all different kinds of angles on this franchise and these characters. If we're going to get, let's go full on horror nerdy and we got to rank these. Um, so for this, for the, just the trilogy. Okay. Let's not get, since I'm just springing this on everyone. <laughs> so we'll just do the David Gordon green trilogy. And, mm -hmm. and interestingly, for me, the ranking would be uh, the reverse uh, chronological. So I go ends, kills. Uh, well, yeah, so my number one is ends. My number two is kills. And my number three uh, would be the the uh, uh, Halloween 2018. Um, okay. Yeah, that's just... Uh, that's just the way it panned out. I'm glad it did. Uh, I'm glad I watched, you know, from, from worst to best and the worst is <laughs> still really good. And the one after that is even better. And then I just think, I think this is a really nice way to end um, the trilogy. So that's my ranking. Yeah, I would go. I would go three, two, one instead of one, two, three. Yeah. Three, two, one, the countdown, the Halloween countdown. Uh, what about you, Tamika? What, how would you rank the new movies? Um, Halloween 2018. Okay. Then, As in then ends and then kills Halloween kills. So, okay. One, so that's your one, one three, two, three. two, one, three, two, right? But that's your one, one two, three. Okay. So. Oh yes, sorry. So I see what you're asking. <laughs> so your first, your the eighteen is your is your number one. Yes. Okay. And then number two would be ends, and then three is kills. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. I you and know Derek. Ooh, this is tough, but I, I and I almost feel like I need to see ends again to really figure this out. But I think at the moment of this recording, I would go ends as my number one then 2018 is my number two and kills as my number three i love this we but... all did different things <laughs> oh my gosh yeah that is amazing so and I, 2018 is so nostalgic too because i remember like all the excitement and all the coverage that we did on daily dead and the announcement mm -hmm. that you know blumhouse had that they were bringing the franchise back and you know so there's a lot of but I don't know. I just like how different ends was. So I think I'll, I would give that the edge and then kills. I had a lot of fun with too, but it's like rewatchability wise. I don't know. It's, I guess it depends what mood I'm in. So, but at this moment I would go with, with that 
configuration. I will just uh, I will just say rewatchability wise, uh, I watched Kills again and again. It's it's very rewatchable. You could put that on as a background while you write uh, War and Peace, and uh, okay, you won't be disappointed. Oh, it's great. <laughs> it gets better. It gets better the more. It's just so wackadoodle, right? It's just so wackadoodle. Right. Blood splattering everywhere. Evil. They're gonna try, but evil ain't gonna die tonight. <laughs> but a lot the, of people are. The the chant, yeah. yeah. The uh, the the chanting, uh, the the karaoke party that yeah, Tommy the, Doyle, uh, yeah, the speech at the lady who shows up with the the iron, right <laughs> to the street fight. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, kind of, uh, it's classic. That, it's classic. Those are good points. Yeah. There's there's a lot to enjoy there. I, I I look forward to you know like you said when we get this on on home media and I know you know people watching it on Peacock right now too you can keep rewatching it but uh, just watching the trilogy this new one like together it'll be really interesting to see what that whole arc like how cohesive it is and I know like originally they were going to just do two movies and then they like kind of flushed it out to three so I'm I'm glad that we got three out of it because I can only imagine like with just two like it might have felt really even more rushed than it does in certain parts already so um, mm -hmm. like Cor Corey would have been like a background character in the first one like they're trying to get that started and like all these different other elements are happening oh, Christ, but, they'd have to put out special editions like lucas I mean, you, <laughs> you would lose the musical number that you know. Corey's eight feet tall and everyone else is five five feet oh this so they insert oh. him into scenes in oh. 2018 <laughs> yeah maybe we'll get the the david gordon green uh you know the revamped cut or or something like that 20 maybe. years from now but but maybe in in the meantime uh, any final thoughts that you both have on on ends that you would like to end on when you look back on this movie and i have i have two things to say okay uh one i love this movie and two, lighten the fuck up, Francis. Sorry, Francis. We're sorry. We're sorry, Francis. We'll, yes, we'll apologies. Be we'll be better on this slander next time. <laughs> well, we'll that is for it with Soup Fest. <laughs> we will. Yes, we'll we'll have something for everyone with Soup Fest. <laughs> oh yeah. And, no. I'm I'm glad because I I I know that it seems like the two of you really enjoy Halloween Kills and I just really just really don't and it kind of put me in a bad space with Halloween Ends because I I didn't want to watch it because mm -hmm. I thought oh no this is just gonna be more of that and I'm really glad that I was wrong and I'm glad that I watched it. And I definitely look forward to watching it again, even though I'm still conflicted, even though we've talked about it, you know, I definitely yeah. am glad I watched it and I'll definitely rewatch it. Well, that's, that's good. I mean, it's, it's gotten, I think we can all take away, you know, even though we maybe didn't love every moment of these new movies, I think there's something we can all take away and enjoy. And, uh, you know, hopefully the years will be kind to these movies and people will yes. find something to revisit and, yeah. and look at in different ways over the years. And at least we got new Halloween movies to begin with. So well, I am going to watch that opening scene of Halloween ends. Oh, my gosh. A bad kid going over that railing <laughs> as many God. times as I've seen that person hitting the oh railing God. on Titanic, the guy who clunks <laughs> on his way oh. down. I'm going to watch it. It's going to be part of a reel that I have of uh, oh deaths that I especially put enjoy on, on camera. Wow. Well, so I'm we know what the, the Drebit cut looks like. Yes, we do. It's it's 90 minutes <laughs> of that little guy being kicked over the ledge by Corky. Oh my God. And on that note, I think we've <laughs> arrived at our destination, our final destination uh, with Halloween ends. Uh, thank you, Scott and Tamika, for going on this journey into Haddonfield one last time, at least for now. Uh, 
We want to thank Brian, our engineer, for helping us out every episode. And as always, we want to thank you, our listeners, including those of you who have signed up for a Corpse Club membership. Make sure to visit corpseclub.com to check out our latest episode and all previous episodes as well. You can also sign up to become a member, which will give you access to all sorts of ghoulish goodies from our t-shirts. We've got a pin and also the ability to suggest an episode topic. So I guess, you know, if you really want us to talk more Halloween ends, you can become a member and suggest it and we'll have no choice. So, <laughs> you know, and if it has, a, you know, if we think it, maybe it's just Scott signing up to be a member. So we will talk about this movie more, but we'll, we'll uh, go down that road when we, when we get to there. Uh, don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Every rating and review really does help. You can also find us on Google Play, SoundCloud, and all of your favorite podcast providers. If you want to get in touch, you can reach us anytime at contact at corpseclub.com or on Twitter at Daily Dead News or at Corpse Club and on Instagram and Facebook under Corpse Club. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, Stay scary.